Well, hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Christy Furio. I am your host for the show, and I'm always happy to have you along here today. We have a great show in store for you uh, with Andre Ironman of Eversys, talking about some pretty great topics around automation, marketing, uh, palette development, um, his story throughout the career, his uh, coffee career. It's really a fascinating conversation. And Andre is just a fascinating guy. So uh, welcome to this episode. And uh, it would be really helpful to me and the show to have you subscribe, both if you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe and uh, hit the notification bell on YouTube, as well as subscribe on your podcast platforms, wherever you are listening to this right now. Um, is really great to be subscribed. I personally, as a podcast listener, uh, I, I like to search the podcasts for topics that are relevant to me. There is over 800, it's 70, 880 or so published episodes of Keys to the Shop. If you have a podcast player where you get to search the topics you, and you're subscribed to the show, that's a great way to uh, draw relevant content from this show, especially with that back catalog of episodes. So uh, also sharing keys to the shop on social media. That's such a huge thing. It makes a big difference. So if you're on Instagram or LinkedIn or something like that, and you are just really uh, vibing with what we're talking about and it's helping you in your business, send out uh, uh, just a note and tag keys to the shop and uh, share the show with your friends. So thank you very much, everybody. Now, um, one of the things that we do here at Keys to the Shop is not just the podcast, but also one-on-one -on -one coaching. I've been doing this for many years. Uh, well over 60 uh, businesses have trusted Keys to the Shop coaching with helping them either just get started as a coffee shop and launch successfully, or they are already successful coffee shops, but there might be some challenges and opportunities and ways that they need some clarity and outside perspective to help with management or operations, scaling and uh, things like that. So if that's you, and that's uh, something that's interesting where you need an advisor, if you need a consultant and a coach to walk with you through these processes uh, to gain clarity and make the next right step for you, your team and your business, Keys to the Shop Consulting is here to help. So go ahead and email chris at keys to the shop Dot com. We'll have a free discovery call. We have a great conversation and we'll take it from there. Now, Keys to the Shop on top of that also does these key holder coaching groups. Now, these coaching groups are all about uh, you and a cohort of other coffee shop owners helping each other be successful. It has been so rewarding to see the conversations take place over the course of this last couple of seasons of key holder coaching groups. This is a paid mastermind group of coffee shop owners who are dedicated to each other's success. And they are hosted by myself. They last six months. There's a ton of substantial conversation and a lot of breakthrough for everybody. So if you're interested in that, uh, new ones coming up in September to be considered, go ahead and email chris at keys to the shop.com. Today, our episode is brought to you by the wonderful folks over at Ground Control. Ground Control has been really a, just a remarkable company and they have been making remarkable coffee possible for people all, all around the world with their Cyclops Brewer. Their second generation brewer is uh, for, actually 40% less uh, MSRP than the original Cyclops, but it is even better. And it has a 30% higher output of batched cold brew, batched iced uh, uh, lattes are possible with this machine. You've got uh, tea. You can do, of course, amazing batch brew coffee with the ground control brewer. And really, people are finding success with this machine as an all-in-one machine. So go to groundcontrol.coffee, check it out, see if this is the kind of thing that you want. You want higher quality, you want more efficiency, you want to open up new channels for profitability in your store. Ground Control sounds like a good fit. So go ahead and visit them over at groundcontrol.coffee. And uh, the other sponsor of today's episode is the great company of Barista Series. The Barista Series from Pacific has been the cornerstone of plant-based performance excellence ever since the beginning. The Barista Series 
is a line of plant-based performance beverages that is created for baristas. It is tested by amazing world-class baristas before it reaches your shelf. And that's why the extensive lineup that they have always performs on bar, stands up to the heat from steaming, produces awesome texture for latte art. It also keeps the beverage uh, taste focused on the coffee, which is huge. And so uh, I would encourage you to go to pacificfoodservice.com, check them out for yourself, get samples and taste what the difference is. You know, yeah, I think you're really going to be impressed. So will your staff and your guests. If you're looking for the best plant-based beverages out there, then you have to be using the Barista Series. So today we're going to be talking with Andre Ironman of Eversys. Andre's coffee journey started uh, as a coffee trader in Switzerland, and he moved shortly after that uh, stint as a coffee trader to Kenya and Tanzania. He spent most of his time on coffee farms and cupping and learning his, you know, the palate development and in the laboratory where he cupped, you know, 800 coffees a day. Uh, he really developed his uh, sense of what the coffee industry is all about. And after this time at Origin, he worked for several coffee roasters in marketing all across Europe. And he gained a deep understanding of the coffee industry from whole bean to uh, RNG to instant to uh, ready to drink category. And now Andre's last years have been especially exciting since he entered the specialty coffee world. He founded an, a, he founded a coffee academy he launched a specialty coffee range. He worked as a trainer and competed and judged in barista competitions. And in 2017, he reached the semifinals of the World Barista Championship in Seoul while working as a marketing director at the same time. Uh, already, you can tell Andre is not one to be idle and has been investing himself and investing in the industry for quite a long time. Uh, after that, uh, semifinals performance in Seoul. Uh, Andre went to deepen his coffee science knowledge in, during a collaboration with Zurich University. And then his research project culminated with a scientific publication of something called the extraction of single serve coffee capsules, linking the properties of coffee ground extraction dynamics to cup quality in nature and science reports. In addition, Andre is a certified Arabica Q grader, as well as an AST for the Specialty Coffee Association. He's actually an author who wrote uh, the book, Inspire and Get Inspired, to share his passion for specialty coffee. After publication, he continued his journey to work in Melbourne, where he worked as GM for Victoria Arduino. And finally, Andre is back in his home country of Switzerland, where he has joined Eversys uh, in the Swiss mountains there. And, this has been a whirlwind of a career for Andre, and he has seen the world. In fact, if you follow Andre on Instagram, you will see him drinking coffee in, it seems like a different place every single day. And so I love following Andre online to see where he is in the world. In today's episode, we're gonna be talking about his journey in coffee, developing his sensory skills. Uh, we're gonna be talking about what it takes to create a great customer experience, a real memorable customer experience. And that's huge for what we are uh, wanting to do in specialty coffee shops. You know, it's all about an experience. And as a marketer, Andre has a lot to share in terms of how this experience can be executed in balancing our needs, uh, our customer's needs and wants with what we're able to do in the shop. We do talk about automation and automation's role in the industry as well as how we can still invest in people and in training and where these things fit in the overall future of specialty coffee shops. Uh, it's really fascinating. And what I really appreciate about Andre is his optimism toward uh, the industry and the experiences that we're creating for people through coffee. So without anything else from me, let's get right to it. Here now is my conversation with Andre Ironman of Eversys. Andre, welcome to Keys to the Shop. So great to have you on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you for uh, having me. I would rather say it's an honor to be on your show. Oh, I appreciate that. This is a conversation that I've really been kind of angling to have for quite a while uh, because I have been following uh, your posts on LinkedIn and elsewhere around you know, different subjects related to marketing and innovation and automation. And I feel, first of all, I feel really, e even though sometimes I'm like, I don't know about this, 
I'm so energized by the way you write about coffee and your, your positivity toward the industry, I think is very refreshing. And I, I just feel like, yeah, I feel like you're like your book title. I'm inspired. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're going to get into a bunch of great topics that will be maybe challenging, um, but also rewarding, but maybe we should start in the beginning to talk about how your career uh, in coffee began and where you came from before coffee. Uh, talk a little bit about that. How did this start for you? I started in a completely different uh, area. So I was born and raised uh, in uh, Switzerland and I studied uh, at the University of Basel, my hometown. I studied finance, marketing and organization and leadership. And I even got my uh, master's degree in this. And during my studies, I uh, run a little company. I founded my own company and uh, distributed uh, my own uh, clothing range and sports equipment uh, in Switzerland. So I really come from the sports side. I'm from the same hometown as also Roger Federer. We even uh, once played uh, tennis together. Really? So I was like a, a very sporty man that uh, needed kind of a job later and uh, a headhunter contacted me. I joined interviews at Procter & Gamble, at uh, Unilever. So the big, uh, fast moving, consuming good, uh, goods companies, but I didn't feel comfortable. Until the moment the headhunter asked me, are you drinking coffee? And I was like, no, I never had a, a coffee in my life. And uh, I remember her name was Barbara. She smiled and said, ah, I got this uh, green coffee trading company. They're also based in Switzerland. They're looking for a junior coffee trader. What do you think? They're down to earth. They are pragmatic and very international. So I went at the age of uh, 26 to that interview. And that's when I had my very, very first uh, coffee. And it was black. It was uh, very bitter. It was kind of hot. And the vice president looked at me and says, and what do you think? And I looked at him and said, this is really super tasty. He smiled and said, ah, I see. He, you are a real coffee professional. You can distinguish great coffee right away. <laughs> and I passed that uh, very first uh, test. I went to the vice president, uh, to the president, uh, Paul Muller. He looked at me and he said, Andre, you told... Uh, my colleague, uh, the vice president, you will give him tennis lessons for free if you join. But uh, what about Monday evening? Would you join us to play football? And I was like, what's wrong with these people? A president and a vice president talking about football and all these things. And uh, I just loved the people. They were very pragmatic. The stories they told me about traveling through Colombia or Papua New Guinea or what they did in Indonesia or in Uganda, and I just came from this little Swiss country, so beautiful and clean, no big adventure, and I thought, okay, that's cool. And they promised me once I sign, I will only stay max two years in Switzerland, and will then move straight away into an origin country. Wow. So I was, I was up for that, and for a couple of months, every uh, Monday evening, I asked Paul, I said, when can I now finally travel? to Coffee Origin. And it happened one Monday, he called me in the office and says, uh, what are you doing next weekend? And I looked at him and said, why? I'm going to uh, watch uh, my home team uh, playing football. He said, "Ah oh, no, we booked a flight for you. And I looked at him and he said, I got a flight for you to Kenya. It will be one way. Just go home, open a bottle of wine, uh, think it through. And what do you think? And uh, I said yes, yeah. and that's how my coffee journey started. At 26, first coffee of my life, crazy interview questions about uh, tennis and uh, football and uh, not at all related to business. And then a couple of months later, one-way ticket to Kenya, full immersion into coffee, and I started my coffee career in Kenya and Tanzania at the uh, origin in a quality lab tasting up to 800 uh, cups of coffee a day and then picking the one I liked uh, the most and they brought it to my table and that was a truly happy life during the week and during the weekend 
we went to visit uh, farms, uh, wet mills, dry mills. Uh, it was really 24-7 uh, full coffee immersion, the best way to start. Wow. I mean, that's huge. Uh, the immersion, I like the idea that you just kind of went on this adventure uh, that took you out of all of the places that you were familiar with in your routine. Uh, and I imagine, though, that your experience in entrepreneurship and in sports also played a big part in how you approached the challenges that you faced in acclimating yourself to the coffee industry, um, developing your palate to be able to progressively taste coffee more uh, accurately and uh, communicate about coffee. So over the course of your time in Kenya and with this company, um, how, what kind of a learning curve did you experience? I mean, when, how, how soon were you feeling pretty confident in your skills and what role did your past career play in how you found some success in your growth in coffee? It was really the, the sensory part that I found uh, the most uh, difficult. So I first stayed uh, nine months in Switzerland and we had like one or two cuppings a week, maybe 50 cups a day then. And honestly, it was very hard. The first cupping I still remember to me, it just tasted all the same. Mm -hmm. And there was a clear cut between the Arabica and the Robusta. And for me, after like 20 or 40 cups, whatever was on that table tasted the same. So I could not even distinguish uh, when the Robusta started. Then after those nine months traveling uh, to, to Kenya, there there was uh, the QC uh, lab director. His name was uh, Sami Kimani, I still remember. He was like my personal coach. And when we went through several hundred cups a day, he would start with the first cup and just give me the full cup description from flavors, from tactile and taste balance. So he went first, described the cup, I went next. Then we went to the next cup and we did the same. Yeah. And uh, that was the moment uh, I learned uh, to cup just through having a super experienced uh, QC lab manager that uh, openly spoke what uh, he discovered in the cup. And it took about uh, two months time to really get uh, on the level where he turned around and he gave me a cupping spoon and he says, Andre, now you are able to cup on your own. Now I trust uh, what you write down will be in the cup. And uh, I really felt like, uh, wow, that's, that's amazing. Uh, now I can uh, really uh, do it. And that was also the moment. Sometimes in the morning you walked into the lab and you just smelled and you knew, okay, in this direction is a cup uh, with a defect inside. Wow. That was the moment you did not even have to cup everything uh, again and over again, because you just detected uh, things straight away. And yeah. that really, I think it's the sensory skills that are <laughs> the key, not, not the keys to the shop, but to the key to coffee in general. And that really helped me so much. Later, when it comes to, for example, product development uh, for big companies uh, that have, could have been like uh, whole beans or ready to drink products or instant coffee. Once you know how to evaluate uh, a thing in a cup uh, from a sensory perspective, you are fine. Also mm. then looking at uh, becoming a barista, once you can taste what's coming out of the machine, you can set the parameters uh, accordingly to make it taste uh, even better. And I even uh, roasted my coffee life on stage. And being able to taste different roast profiles and then you connect the dots and you will understand if I have a higher drop temperature or bigger rate of rise uh, at the beginning or longer development time and you can link it to, to sensory. That's when you start to master coffee. So I really think mm. the sensory part, uh, that was the, the greatest thing uh, to learn when I was uh, at Origin. 
that was, I would say, the, the biggest thing back then. What I also learned, and uh, that helps me a lot today, looking at coffee, at the entire value chain especially, it's to understand how coffee is produced. What's, what does it need to produce a great cup of coffee? How do you cultivate coffee? How do you pick uh, the cherries? How do you uh, dry, process, uh, and so on? That was the second, second huge pillar that really helped me in everything I do today uh, to have understood what's happening at origin. Sensory and the understanding of the backstory and the uh, how coffee is produced now, uh, to, you know, we have a focus on such a variety of different delivery mechanisms of coffee. And the challenge, it seems, is to create a direct line from what you're drinking to where it came from, especially in coffee. Um, I don't know a whole lot of other industries who put such a premium on the story behind what you're drinking, even in convenience products. Um, but from your experiences, it, it, it seems like there's there's a value that that story brings. And that directly ties to marketing and how we get customers to uh, give an opportunity to a product or to a coffee, uh, whatever it might be. Um, you're, how have you experienced that understanding of the story as a value adding element to getting customers to try coffee and to, in, in, in a way that opens them up to the possibilities? I think storytelling today is is very important. And uh, obviously uh, now I'm working in uh, in marketing and how I see marketing telling a compelling story is uh, the key to success. But it cannot only be compelling as such. I also think it needs to be very authentic and it needs to link back what you do, not just as a product, but as a company to the purpose why you have uh, built or founded uh, this company. And it also needs to link back to your uh, values. So just talking about the product without the link back to why you do things and how you do it, uh, I think is very uh, important. And when you are telling a story to me you also need first to well understand your customer to listen to them to understand their needs and once you think you know what they need and you start uh, putting to together your uh, story you also need to keep in mind it needs to be uh, relevant for them it's not just what you want to tell and what you think uh, would be great it need, really needs to be like uh, targeting the person you are uh, talking to. And then that would be a successful story. So it's the, it's the receiver of the story, the listener, as well as the, the author and everything in, in between. So if you say this coffee has a very great story, here's the, the family and it's got a long history, but it's not the right fit for the person you're trying to convince to drink it, uh, you'd be convincing them against their will in the moment and counting it as a victory. But when they walk away from you, they're like, I'll, I'll, I'll never drink that coffee again. <laughs> and that's not a victory. No, sometimes, you know, I come into a, into a coffee shop and uh, I don't know what happened. You know, I, I'm traveling a lot. So maybe after a 20 hours flight uh, to Melbourne, uh, you arrive and you just want to have a, a cup of coffee. You just want to sit down and you want to grab that uh, cup of filter coffee and it warms you up and it kind of grounds you. And the barista starts telling you, you know, that's the cup profile. Uh, the producer did this and that. And maybe at this very moment, uh, as a customer, I, I'm not ready to receive uh, this message. Mm. Maybe after uh, a, a good sleep, the next morning I go back uh, to the same shop. Uh, I look at the barista and it's like, all right, yesterday I uh, was not ready. Today, uh, give me the big menu. Let me go through. Uh, let's have a chat. Uh, what can I have as a tasting menu? 
is there a flight uh, to go through it, it it really depends on the on the situation your personal mood uh, so when you look at communication it's clearly not the one message fits all at all times you have a message uh, so there is a sender there is an, is a receiver and all three things they they need to be aligned yeah and you walked into a cupping lab after having acclimated your palate and become skilled in tasting coffee you mentioned earlier you could smell what was going on before tasting and yes. it it strikes me that when a coffee professional in a shop who wants to be effective in the way that they present coffee, they have a responsibility to smell, uh, so, and to, so to speak, the atmosphere that is in the shop. So like a customer walks in and they have this, like, I'm not going to say they smell, but they give off the impression that maybe they're sleepy from a 20 hour flight. And so our hospitality brain then should kick in and be like, I'm not going to say the thing. I'm just going to serve the coffee and in so doing, not saying what the story of coffee of that coffee is, it actually serves coffee better than mm. to just apply it, uh, with no regard. So there's the skill similar to tasting for people who apply marketing or even just information, uh, when it comes to coffee service in, in shops in particular, I think. And this, we, we often thinking about baristas, we talk about the art of coffee making. And at the end of the day, yes, it, it needs time, it's skills, but anyone can learn. But the other art to me is much more of an art and much more important. And that's the, the art of serving coffee. Mm. And I think that's the art that is so much more important. I traveled the world i have been backstage for world barista championship world brewers cup championship if i want i can taste like the 20 to 30 best coffees it's tricky to say best coffees best. let's say the 20 to 30 coffees from producer that are now on top that go to the finals or win a world uh, coffee championship. So if I want, I, I can do that on a daily basis. But there was, for example, this one coffee shop uh, in, in Melbourne that I e even drove to for 40 minutes uh, from my office once a week. And that was not because it was the best coffee that you could get in terms of uh, the cupping spore, score. But the barista waved at me already from far away, a hundred meter when she saw me said, oh, Andre is coming and waved, yeah. started to smile, immediately asked me how I feel, how my weekend went and so on. And you're like, wow, it's a coffee shop. But you immediately felt home, connected, welcome. And sometimes uh, she says, today I will surprise you. And it was maybe just a little cookie or she added uh, some milk or she did some latte art and it, it was just beautiful. And literally whatever she would have offered me would have been perfect mm. because it's, it was more the art of serving me coffee than looking at the scales and dialing into perfection. Of course, the coffee was fine, but... It was amazing. She could like literally read my mind and yeah. she knew when I was in a good mood or in a bad mood and she just had the right answer. And I was sitting there and sh I saw she did the same with all the clients. She knew their names. She talked to the dogs and the pets that came uh, with the clients. Uh, she knew the orders straight away or she added just a little marshmallow for the little boy that ordered a, a hot chocolate. And that to me, that, that makes the difference. And that's also where communication uh, kicks in. It, it's interesting that we have a um, very technical focus on coffee because it, well, first of all, people are messy and it's hard. It's mm -hmm. emotional. And so the, the procrastination in us 
forces us to focus on distribution tools and um, other things that don't talk back to us or don't, you know, have bad moods. It, it just is science. Um, but the craft and the art of doing what this barista was doing, this proprietor of this business was doing, is what adds the value to the coffee that allows people to create sustainable demand for things that we hope that they will continue to buy. Um, but we miss it sometimes. And I, I just yesterday, I, I got back from a very uh, interesting and long trip, a lot of airline issues. And on my way back, I stopped by a place that is well known in the Nashville, Tennessee, the US area called Crema Coffee. And they were amazing. And I was very, very tired. And but I could sense the uh, the sparkle in their hospitality, in their their attitude. It was just like something was so different. And the coffee was great. But I still, even now, I just walk. I think about that, and like they are people focused. And mm -hmm. when we think about all of the innovation happening in coffee and what we're trying to do to change coffee or the future of coffee, whether the moniker that we want to give it, sometimes we don't focus on the most simple of things. And we wonder why some of those efforts don't work out as much. Um, and I'm curious about how you have perceived the uh, innovation in the industry and the direction things are going and whether or not it's a a benefit or an indictment. And my, my explanation of that is, it very well could be an indictment on the fact that we're not delivering what you just described. And so people have to fill that void with novelty sometimes uh, to make it more interesting versus fulfilling and simple. So give me your perspective right now on where we are with innovation and um, the future of the industry. And are we getting it or are we just using novelty and innovation to cover up a lack in something that's just evergreen and universally valuable. What I see in the coffee business is that many, even friends of mine, they open a coffee shop and they have a very romantic uh, view on how that uh, can work. And they often forget coffee as such is a business. And when you run a business, uh, you can't get away from numbers. And in a way, if you want to run a business successfully, that means you need to make profit somewhere. And I see now traveling uh, globally that uh, I see that uh, many coffee shops that uh, started in a romantic way are struggling a lot. The industry, the economy is shaky in several uh, countries. So it's also about uh, consolidation and uh, cleaning a bit. The ones that started in a romantic way and all, I love them. I truly love them and I'm emotionally connected to them, but it's also sad to see that they don't succeed. So coffee clearly is a, is a business. You talked about the distribution tools and uh, all the gadgets that you can uh, get today. And don't forget, uh, in my preparation, uh, five months to the World Barista Championship, I extracted uh, about 23,000 shots and I measured them all. And I, I tried out all the cool and hipster tools. And luckily, I found the one that worked for me the best. It's it's interesting. It's one aspect of getting product excellence to the next level. But looking when you're running a coffee shop, it's not only about uh, the product uh, excellence. As you mentioned, it's about how you get that product uh, across. I can also see that uh, looking at innovation in, in the past, coffee was simple. It was a black coffee, maybe an espresso, or it was a, a long black or Americano or a filter brew. And then came the milk. And now when you look at menus, uh, there can be up to 50 items on a menu card. Yeah. So that's a heavy burden uh, for a barista. In the past, he just had to extract uh, 
milk, coffee, then takes your milk. And now he needs to become like a, a beverage creative uh, director. And then suddenly he's also in an environment like a drive through So it's not only 50 beverages instead of two or three. It's also preparation time should be like uh, 30 seconds instead of uh, one minute. So I, I clearly see that uh, with innovation and consumer needs changing, that uh, there is a lot of stress suddenly running a coffee shop. So suddenly you have two, three, four lane uh, drive through uh, operations uh, to handle. That's not the same thing maybe you had in mind when you opened your little community coffee shop uh, with your partner yeah. in your neighborhood. And this to me is also innovation. It's difficult to say, is it good or is it bad? Clearly there is a, a consumer need and it seems many people love the need for speed. And I believe that's mm -hmm. totally okay. And there is a coffee option or there are many coffee options uh, for them. You can deliver even great service in a drive through uh, environment. You can talk about the digital ordering system, automated uh, payment solution, and having uh, a barista behind uh, a wall and with a microphone uh, and speaker on, uh, pushing out uh, coffee after coffee. Th that is innovation today. But I also see that we have the, the other side, the slow coffee side. We can see the many, especially in Asia, the omakase style uh, offers that you can get. Uh, you see them in coffee. I have done uh, a chocolate omakase style. Uh, I did a Korean barbecue in Busan now during the, the World Barista Championship or a little yakitori omakase style uh, back in Taipei. So I see that we have several routes to go. And it's up to each of us to choose which one uh, we want to go. It's interesting that you mentioned we can't decide or it's hard to decide which is good and which is bad because innovation, when you say the word innovation, the automatic response is, oh, that has got to be good. Um, when I, there was a long time ago, I worked in a coffee shop and the knock box broke. Um, we, for some reason we didn't get the knock box replaced. Uh, so we had to use a broom handle and a trash can for two weeks. That was innovation, but it wasn't good. Uh, were we proud of ourselves? Okay, sure. But um, it was it was because of something else that we did that. But had I started to sell broom handles and trash cans as my, my innovative next product, you don't need to buy a knockbox. Here's a trash can and a broom handle. Um, it could have opened up a new category. Uh, of, of things and people, oh, this is innovative. And so that, that brings up the question of how, can innovation go to, so far because there is this, a little bit of a uh, unreasonable automatic response to innovation that it's always good, always positive, similar to growth. When people say, well, if I have more shops, that's always better. Um, if I have more products, that's always better. And we had just, you mentioned that sometimes that pressure and it can be a little bit too much. So when, when can, in your opinion, innovation go too far where, where it becomes not so much innovation, but just noise? It's a very good question. Looking at innovation and doing innovation just for the sake of innovation, I believe is the wrong thing to do. Innovation to me and real innovation at the end has to add value. It has to always be relevant to a consumer. And going back to what we said at the beginning, just to innovate for innovation, but no connection with uh, the why, why you have opened uh, your business with your vision and your value. I think that's the the wrong innovation uh, to go for. That's a good point. And the question then becomes, how often do we sit down with the question 
versus accept it as a lot of people will come to me in consulting and they'll ask, you know, well, they'll say, I have to open a drive through And the, I say, well, no, you don't. And be, it, it will prove it. Why do you have to? Mm -hmm. um, and it's because that's what everyone is doing. So then we get this marketing force. Marketing itself becomes this, you know, creation of scarcity and FOMO and uh, we feel like you've got to act on this because this is the trend. This is what people are doing. So when I, as a coffee entrepreneur say, I want to open a coffee shop, what's everybody doing without knowing the backstory or that maybe the operator decided to take on a model that they themselves aren't even sure about to us, it feels like, well, they're in business and therefore they must've had a good reason to do that. <laughs> Sometimes there wasn't a good reason, but we're going to multiply that, you know, to our business. So I guess the question is, um, how do we responsibly market trends and options to people while at the same time, encouraging people to, uh, consider their values and consider the end result. Because if you did want a community gathering space, maybe opening a double drive through is not for you. Uh, but if you did want that really quick service is truly what you want, maybe it is. So what responsibility do we in the industry who present these options to people, what responsibility to we, do we bear to give them the caveats, to give them the a little bit of sobriety in the message it's hard uh, hard to answer i would say it's important to stay curious so when i'm looking at innovation i i keep uh, my eyes open i want to check it out uh, everything and i want to try to match it is there really a consumer need and link it back does it make sense to me and also with my values if i want to focus on quality and quality mm. is a king or queen, as you want to say, then you need to see, as you mentioned, the drive through, is that the right uh, format for me? If you say, yes, drive through is the right format, but quality to me is still uh, the first priority, then you must uh, create uh, the best drive through quality coffee offering uh, in the world. And then maybe that could be an interesting uh, direction uh, to go for. Let me ask you this. Um, you, you mentioned consumer needs. Hmm. And sometimes we will speak for the sake of the consumer and say, well, they need this, but maybe they don't. So how do we know what a, <laughs> maybe it, what is the need? How do we determine a need that the consumer has? versus something that we want to give the consumer and then we manufacture it. We say, of course they need this because I want to give it to them. Hmm. It's a good point. I have been in, in many consumer inside the studies where you even put the uh, cameras into someone's home and don't get me wrong. Uh, they agreed uh, to do that uh, <laughs> before that has a name. It's called uh, home user uh, or home usage uh, test. And then you, you observe how people make coffee in the kitchen in the morning and you really look at them. You, de you observe what they do. You ask them questions later to really fully understand what they do and why they do it. I still remember there was uh, this one guy in a video that woke up uh, very early in the morning and went into the kitchen. I thought he's going to rub someone. And then uh, he warmed up some water and uh, had uh, an instant coffee. But at the same time, he had a capsule coffee machine, uh, mocha in the, in the kitchen, but also a, a single group uh, espresso machine with a grinder. And I was like, why is this guy making instant coffee in the morning? And then we ask him and said, ah, you know, my partner is still sleeping. So instant coffee is the best way uh, to have my caffeine kick in the morning and not waking my partner up. Yeah. So there are really ways to to understand. And that's maybe will help you to optimize a current offering and to fine tune it and to make sure that the people will stay uh, loyal to it or 
buy a little bit more i would say that will be your incremental sales yeah and that is also interesting to do but when it comes to innovation or going a step further and creating or shaping demand then it's less of listening to someone what they need today and you rather need to think wow well, how is going what's the future going to look like are people traveling more are people staying home longer do they need to do they want to meet more people or do they just want to stay uh, alone yeah and then you can start thinking what kind of offer you can uh, give to them in the future and that's the kind of innovation or the thinking i i love uh, the most but that comes with a lot of risk as well oh i'm sure and there there's a vulnerability that customers today especially being saturated with marketing and have have basically we've all opened ourselves up to an incredible rate of marketing versus previous generations we we are the ultimate receivers of messages uh, we get it all day long and we're very good at it. And we, you know, people in business know this. And so we tailor our, our messages because we know that people are going to basically say, well, you're the coffee expert, you know, and so I'm just going to go along with it. Um, so the question, I guess, is when people have a proclivity to choose something that's more convenient for them, is it always in their best interest and in the best interest of the industry to go along with a customer's need or their perceived need versus, and I, I don't mean to make this sound like paternal or anything, but it's like, <laughs> is it really the best thing for you? Is it that you just want coffee delivered directly to your blood system, <laughs> your, your veins, uh, uh, or, or is going to a coffee shop and getting out of your car and being in the, that environment actually better for you? Um, and so it's like need versus want, um, where are we just saying we, are a, we, we respond to customers as they respond to our messages with our innovative products, like ready to drink coffee, for example. Don't, don't go to the coffee shop, drink a bottle of coffee and, uh, but it might be better for the customer to actually be in the coffee shop environment. But what we've done is we've not taken on the responsibility to think farther down the line of the long-term impact of those decisions. I mean, what, what's, what do you think about all of that? Because it feels like some of that, the product innovation is taking advantage of sort of a race to the bottom in terms of customer personal investment into coffee that actually makes it more valuable in the long term mm. i clearly see this race to the bottom when particularly looking at the ready to drink i'm, I'm not quite sure whether all is a race uh, to the bottom i still see that uh, there are many offerings looking at higher quality greater uh, in cup uh, quality you discussed before or mentioned the need and the want. We, we should not forget. Many, many people, they drink coffee for the daily caffeine kick. And there it's so hard to add value. There I rather see, yes, leave it to them. Leave it as, as a race to the bottom. It's, it's very hard to get them out of this spiral. But you mentioned uh, being inspired or getting inspired. Uh, I would then leave that segment to the race to the bottom and see how can we add value? How maybe can we create uh, a ready to drink uh, experience or how can we take them out from the ready to drink and get them back into uh, a coffee shop? Mm. How can we can get them back uh, into a cafe and have a, a human interaction uh, experience. And I'm not quite sure whether it's always the product that will make that difference. I think the human connection and the human touch might be even more uh, important. 
So the service side and not just the, the product. It feels like there's a little bit of a pushing away from the human element when it comes to what coffee shops are investing a lot of time and energy into the instant, the bottled automation mm-hmm. itself as a tool to uh, have fewer people working, but with the promise of freeing the barista up to do more, while at the same time, sometimes, and and this is just my opinion, ignoring that a lot of operators out there are not necessarily going to reinvest a lot of resource into the people that they do have working once they are freed up to, to do this. Future of coffee shops, and I've, I've seen you post this many times that, you know, you've experienced a lot of uh, innovative or, you know, new expressions of coffee shops and the, the term future of coffee or coffee shops is out there. So let me ask you what you think that future looks like and is it encouraging or is it uh, disconcerting? I don't uh, eat happy pills every morning, but uh, I'm staying positive. I really think the, the future of coffee still looks very bright. Yes, there is the labor crisis and there is no way to shy away from that. It's so hard to find the skilled people. Once you find them, there is a study in average 110 10 days and then they're gone again. Then you have generation Z and yes, they don't maybe want to work very hard. They need a lot of breaks. You need to talk to them in a very uh, nice and kind uh, manners. At the same time, they will be very hard to please as a customer. I see coffee pricing going through the roof. Uh, it, it is hard to run a coffee business today, yet I still think the future looks bright. I know I posted a lot recently about instant coffee. And uh, it, it, <laughs> I used to be brand manager for JDE back in 2007 for instant coffee and uh, ready to drink. And I still remember That was at the beginning of specialty coffee in Europe. Everybody said, never, ever we will do that. Now I had instant coffee from uh, the barn. I had an instant coffee from a Chinese uh, manufacturer called Saturn Bird in collaboration with Patrick Rolf. So the Scandinavian uh, brewers and uh, barista champion. And they have been using uh, Panama is uh, an instant coffee that I have tried uh, from Blue Bottle, single origin. And mm-hmm. it's interesting to see these uh, convenience uh, formats. I don't want to say which one, but some are better than the others. And if you are somewhere and you have zero brewing equipment and you only have hot water, they kind of deliver an okay cup. It's not uh, what the barista would do with a freshly roasted, freshly ground uh, coffee, but it's definitely a million times better of what I have been selling back uh, in two th- 2007. Yeah. So I see there is innovation there. The quality is improving and what we thought is never possible starts to be possible today, maybe 2007, convenient was not that of a big thing, but it seems to be very big uh, today. But you never know where things are heading to. I said I did a lot of uh, omakase style uh, experiences. I remember I was in Taipei at the Simple Kaffa that was founded by the 2016 World Brista Champion Berg Wu. And I stayed for about uh, two hours. And we just had the three coffees yeah. and it was a truly fantastic experience. We were three guests. We had uh, two baristas and they just took such great care of us. We did uh, food pairing with the cake financier and you had two different cakes and you were supposed to take a bite and then have a sip of the coffee. And the moment you took a sip of the coffee together with the cake, the sensory experience changed that much. And then you took a bite of the other cake. 
and just the cake itself was very normal but then in combination with the coffee it was just like mm. so the, the, the texture suddenly was so uh, creamy and buttery and that took more than two hours and it cost a lot of money so i would go back but the question is i don't have time every day two hours to do that and i definitely don't have the money to do that uh, on a daily basis but from time to time such experiences are, are just beautiful and it connects you you know the in my chance i'm very lucky and fortunate that i know some of these farmers and to me it's always great to taste coffee from a farmer that i have personally met that that adds so many more uh, emotions and i clearly see that there is also a route down this road quality personal uh, experience multi-sensory experience now you see a lot about uh, the right cups uh, opening up uh, thicker or thinner different uh, colors they play music uh, <laughs> yeah. the seat you're sitting on the surface uh, of the cup or the weight yeah. of the spoon this is a different route and i can clearly also see that there is a trend there and what i experienced for example in china is like the daily coffee intake for the sake of the caffeine now belongs to the big chains so the specialty coffee shop they moved away from just making normal black uh, coffee and they went into the creation of signature drinks yeah, I went into to a little cafe called uh, Three and a Half, and they got the uh, six drinks on the menu: three mocktails and uh, three coffee-based uh, cocktails. And it's it's a true experience, and they cost maybe four or five times more than just a normal coffee, but that allows them to survive and generate the margin uh, that they need. Mm. And th those are also great routes out of this uh, race to the bottom uh, business. You bring up these examples and I, they are studies in and of themselves of what a market is able to sustain on the extremes where you've got an yes. instant coffee, which is the lowest investment you might want to make, depending on who you get it from, because we have to face it that the instant coffee in terms of accessibility is st in, in the specialty realm is still one of the most inaccessible uh, financial investments a person could make short of buying Costco coffee and you know making it in your Mr. Coffee on your counter, which we've always had the ability to, mm. people have had the ability to do. So in, in one sense, it's, it's not as convenient or as accessible, but it is in innovative and it is novel and it tastes okay which is a, a victory when it comes to instant coffee. And I've partaken in many specialty instant coffees and thought, this is great, kind of. Mm. And then there's that omakase style that you were just talking about, which is the two hours, might as well be a Michelin experience uh, coffee thing, which back in the day, and you know this, there was all of the early, the 2007 through the 2012, 13 or so, or if beyond, I think a lot of people were drawing inspiration from the fine dining scene in the competitions as well. Um, when you talk about Michelin chefs and it, taking things and applying them to the stage. But these are two extremes of coffee where the bulk of the industry is made up of people who live squarely in the middle, who just have a coffee shop and serve cappuccinos. And they see these extremes and they can't necessarily invest in instant coffee. They can't necessarily do a tasting for two hours with, with, with cakes and pairings. What is a normal coffee shop? I'll say quote unquote, normal coffee shop, uh, supposed to do now in this age of coffee that would lead them to have the most success in connecting with their customers, the value of the experience the coffee and the hospitality based on what you've seen you, with your travels and uh, et cetera, that what should we be focusing on now to give us the best chance of success in connecting with the, the consumer amongst the sea of different options that we have to choose from today? I think at this moment, 
a coffee shop owner needs to understand and master the finance part. They need to understand definitely the cost side to really see how they can survive because labor is expensive, coffee is getting more expensive, ingredients are getting expensive. So I think managing the boring financial part to me to be successful is important. Mm. Then when I look uh, at another point, and it seems that there is the elephant of automation uh, in the room, I think, and things come in waves. I don't say automation will be the winner forever, but uh, definitely at the, in the situation we are in today, automation can help coffee shops to survive especially those shops that are struggling to find skilled people. Then that if you can't find the right people, the skilled people, your quality will just decline. And you need to deliver the standard that you have defined and that your uh, current customers uh, are used to. And you need to deliver also the service quality that you have defined. Mm. And then looking how hard it is today to find the people. I think automation can help us in today's labor crisis uh, to deliver consistently the quality we once defined. How do you avoid? And I, and I say this just because it's very anecdotal. Um, my mm. experience in coffee with automation, just going to places that have super autos, et cetera, mm. has been universally bad. Um, in the sense that, you know, you may be in airports and other places that they don't have the, they're not in the world of specialty competitive titles and they happen to have adopted, um, a, a super auto machine, but because of their deep connection to the industry, they, they use it in a respectful and great way. So it seems like a lot of the experiences that people have with the proof of automation being that salve for what ails the industry is based on a very high, a higher echelon of a, an example where world barista champions are using it. And of course we're going to make amazing <laughs> coffee with it. But then mm. if we follow that, uh, thread and we say, well, it's hard to hire the right people. We still need to hire people. So reasonably we'd be hiring the wrong people with the right equipment to make up for their being the wrong people. And in my experience, it feels like that still makes bad coffee. Um, so the, the, there's the inescapable reality of the investment into people to, to use the automation or the manual machine um, in the right way. So how much should we expect that a, a piece of equipment and automation should make up for hiring uh, the wrong people or um, and how much of our proof of these things working is based on somewhat of a, a, a very kind of inside bubble experience mm. of, of how these machines are being marketed. First of all, I think today's machines, fully automatic machines, they are truly able to match the quality out of traditional equipment. But the machine by itself, it's a machine, doesn't do it on its own. You still need to go and dial in your espresso. There is fully automatic equipment out there where you still have to define your dose in, your dose out, and your shot time. So that needs to be set properly. So a fully automatic coffee machine cannot replace a skillful barista that knows how to dial in a coffee that needs still to be done. Mm. Then when you look at the, the milk beverages, you still need to define which milk goes with which coffee. What is the ratio of milk that goes with uh, the espresso shot? What is the foam quality you want to have in certain uh, high acidic coffee, very foamy uh, milk doesn't work at all. So you still have to res to, to set all these parameters and set the standards of the quality. And this person, those baristas can never be replaced. 
maybe going back uh, to the World Barista Championship, we should also not forget they only do 12 beverages in 15 minutes. I mean, pretty much anyone can do. That, that is not disrespectful towards uh, the, the championship. They have to do tons and tons of other things during these uh, 15 minutes, but they only need to be consistent for uh, those 12 shots. Imagine now a, a coffee shop uh, in, in Melbourne. They're punching out 1,500 coffees uh, from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. That's hard stuff. I tried to work one shift uh, in Melbourne because I thought, yeah, I'm one of the celebrity uh, championship baristas and I failed miserably. It is so hard to punch out quality coffee nonstop one after the other. But I think uh, Australia is uh, an exception. There are another few cities uh, I don't say Australia is a city, but uh, Melbourne, Sydney, uh, those uh, coffee capitals uh, in Australia, they still manage to punch out high volume quality. Nevertheless, I would say that quality deteriorated since I first arrived in Melbourne 2019. When I left in 2023, it was not the same quality anymore. Hmm. The wait time was so much longer and I think that's where automation could help them. To be very honest, uh, eight, 75 to 80% of the beverages served in uh, Australia are milk beverages. So I don't know what's so cool about texturing 800 to 1,000 milk jugs a day. Th that's the boring part, and it's the bottleneck. You're li literally stuck to the steam wand. So if that's automated, I think that that's perfect. That will really give the person more space to take and, and time to truly and utterly take care of the customers, to greet, say hello, goodbye. Maybe if someone wants, and as you said, they need to smell whether the customer wants or not, tell the story of the producer. I think uh, that's where automation can help to deliver a greater experience and make sure that the quality stays on the same uh, level. But they don't replace the, the training, the education. I think that yeah. would be the wrong thinking. Okay, now I put the fully automatic in. I don't need to train my people anymore. That's when you start losing on your quality. Sure. And there is a pride in work that a barista has when mm. they are trained and they are experienced and they can texture milk well, they can pour milk well. There's the the tactile uh, craft, the craft of it. Um, this is the problem with knowledge work often, which is why so many knowledge workers end up going to manual trades when they find success. They they move from their knowledge work to like start a farm or something. It feels like we're hardwired to have something physically being done. And the turnover rate for a lot of coffee shops in some sense might be due to the fact that we have a fascination with the, um, the cerebral part of the job and not the tactile and investing into people uh, in our baristas. We, we want them to be um, a little bit more like machines and less like people. And it's not very satisfying to do. It's hard to say exactly why something like the scene is you're experiencing it went downhill uh, in terms of wait time and quality. It may be due, for, uh, due to a number of factors, but the fact remains that the right people still are needed to use equipment and the, the ability to deliver value to people has, is directly tied to the quality of the coffee that can be accomplished with or without special equipment. And so I'm curious about the, the limitations of automation. I mean, we just talked about the idea that, you know, if you could come at it from a perspective of trying to do less by investing more in automation in, in terms of, I don't want to hire the right people. Uh, I just want to have the machine do the work 
and mm -hmm. then we won't invest in that way we'll save money um where else can we find automation as a a scapegoat for a for not investing into people so the idea that we're, we're having a hard time is is because of our approach to the barista and our approach to resourcing them well with current available options. Uh, does that make sense? Like we have an, we have novel things that we believe are the answer, but the answer might be staring us right in our face and it's just good communication and good training. No, sometimes, yeah, sometimes I think we, we must not over complicate things. At the end of the day, running a coffee shop is being in the hospitality business. And hospitality is about getting an excellent product to a customer and deliver just a great service. And sometimes we are trying to overdo it. And I personally love just specialty coffee, tasty, clean, sweet, juicy, and no big fuss. And I think there are formats where automation can help deliver such a cup of coffee and such an experience. And sometimes I think still a traditional machine is the best uh, option. It really depends on the, the situation. There is clearly not the one size uh, fits all. Nevertheless, especially today, I think it's it's very hard and many coffee shops are struggling to survive. So a friend of mine opened a coffee shop and she mentioned to me, I need three baristas to run the shop. But uh, to make a profit, it will only work with two. And she says, I don't want to work with a fully automatic coffee machine because I love the machine I have. And I would never, ever give it away. It's funny. It's the coffee machine that uh, I had in my academy. And uh, she got it out of the academy. So she's so attached. So I said, it's no worries. I will come to your coffee shop and I will spend one day. And I will just try to understand how you can make it happen. And let's see whether we can work with two baristas. And I came in and there was one barista coming to me, asking me what I want. And I said, I still need some time to read the menu. The barista went away, came back. I said, uh, sorry, I'm a coffee geek, need a few more uh, minutes. Mm -hmm. So that person came to me and lost a lot of time. And uh, I told my friend, you could do digital ordering, put the QR code. I can read on my phone, put uh, some movies uh, from the farmers, the producers, the pickers, the origin countries. So I will be entertained. And then when it comes to payment, I can order now. I can pay through my Apple Pay. And then you don't need that third barista that, yes, as a human being, you like. And she was very nice to me. But at the end of the day, will not allow you to survive. So sometimes you need also to think it through fact base and make a sacrifice and say three barista will kill my uh, coffee shop. And at the end, three baristas and myself will be out of the job. But uh, by uh, finding ways around and only work with two baristas, we will survive. So th there are other ways than just the uh, automation looking at the equipment at the machine per se, but maybe also the ordering, the payment solution, and how you organize yourself. Well, how you organize yourself, especially the workflow, how the place is built. A, a lot of people try to make up for poor workflow planning in the build out process with um, tools that, well, the bar is too big. We have to travel too far to, to fulfill orders. And, um, our menu is too big. We, sh we, st we started with a menu that requires us to put in these things. And so, yeah, I, I, there are many options and I think it's definitely, and for this conversation, I think that's maybe the theme is out of all the options, deciding which one is the right one, whether it's the right coffee for the right customer or the right equipment for your bar uh, to serve that customer, or even the right barista mm. to work in the coffee bar is incumbent upon us to 
find that by looking at them full faced and say, which one is the right one and actually consider it rather than just making a snap decision, because ultimately you do have to live with that investment for a long time. Um, and it has downstream impact or well, in this case, upstream impact, because the farmer is directly affected by the success or failure, or even if you have financial success as a business, you might be giving coffee a bad name because you're, you're not really showing great hospitality or you, mm. you might be financially successful, but sending the wrong message. So it all feels like in a lot of intentionality around the options, um, that could be intimidating at times. Yes. I'm a big fan of no big fuss, uh, coffee. Mm -hmm. I hardly look at the equipment. As I mentioned that the barista that waved to me from far away, that I will always prefer just a tasty coffee, clean, sweet, juicy, and with great customer service over like the most fancy whatsoever coffee that has been fermented for 920 hours and whatever yeah. triple done and uh, inoculated and shocked and whatever i would always prefer that tasty no big fast coffee from a barista that just welcomes me makes me feel comfortable home and serves that coffee with a smile that, that to me is always the best uh, is always the better cup yeah I love it. Well, Andre, uh, I would love to keep talking here, but um, we've we've covered quite a bit, and I think this has been a fantastic conversation. I'm honored to have you on the show. Where can people follow you on your continued journeys into these coffees experiences uh, around the world and uh, what you do at Eversys? So they can find uh, Eversys on eversys.com uh, or on Instagram uh, or LinkedIn. And myself, uh, under my first and last name, both uh, I'm rather active, as you have seen on Instagram and uh, LinkedIn, and they can uh, both follow Eversys and myself there. Perfect. Andre, thank you. Thank you for your influence and what you do in coffee and uh, really appreciate you being on the show. It was great pleasure. As always, uh, I think it's about the uh, sharing learning uh, and uh, growing uh, together that was a great learning session sharing some ideas with you and thank you so much for having me okay everyone uh, i hope that you enjoyed that conversation you know one of the best things about this conversation to me is the idea that we are constantly exploring and looking for what fits within the context of what our shops uh, uh, where our shops are, what our concept is. Sometimes that's going to uh, be, it's going to be necessary for us to have machines that do this, that, or the other thing. And other times it won't be, but that we are thinking through exactly what we do need and what we want to create for the customer is of ultimate importance. And ultimately, uh, like we said, it's about investing into people and investing into the people who are making the coffee, as well as making sure that how we're making the coffee is an investment into the people who are ultimately drinking the coffee, that the experience is excellent, the product is excellent, the service is excellent. And in that, there's this balance of excellence with, as Andre was talking about, no fuss, having great customer service and being able to um, have a no fuss experience where it's not you know, cerebral work necessarily. Although I know some concepts are definitely a little bit more involved, but ultimately this is about creating something that can be easily loved and consistently excellent. And so I'm grateful for Andre's work and thoughts today around these subjects. And I hope that you are encouraged as well. So if you want to follow Andre on his journeys, then I would encourage you to follow him on Instagram. That is at Andre underscore Ironman. And of course, you can also uh, go to eversys.com to find out more about the company that he's currently working at. Um, but uh, definitely follow Andre on Instagram at the very least. And so a huge thank you to Andre for being on the show. We really appreciate everything you do. 
in coffee. Uh, yeah, it was awesome. So if you have any questions, comments, or feedback for me about today's episode, you can email chris at keys to the shop.com. And also don't forget coffee fest is coming up. Coffee fest here in the U S happens four times a year. The first show this year was in New York city. It was fantastic. Huge show, great turnout, so much value there. This show has been going on for 30 years. I don't know if you realize that, but it is probably the best event that you can go to, to get huge value for your money, Ex free and accessibly priced trainings, workshops, lectures, panel discussions from industry experts to help you with your menu, your, your staffing, your money, the coffee itself and everything in between. And they've been doing this for years and years. Go to coffeefest.com to learn more. There's also, of course, the trade show floor where you can interact with vendors that will help outfit your cafe with some of the best products out there. And uh, I will be there in New Orleans, which is the next one coming up. Go to coffeefest.com and get signed up today for you and your team. You could do the all access pass and just like have your pick of what's going on throughout the entire weekend. Uh, or you can just like piece it together as you see fit, but definitely check it out. Again, do that over at coffeefest.com. And with that, that is the end of our show today, everyone. I so appreciate all of you. Thank you so much for listening and don't forget to subscribe. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop. <laughs>